couple of uh, lectures, as you remember, I started talking about how one can create quasi-one-dimensional Wittberg atoms, how by using pulsed fields you can actually control the electron motion in such atoms, and how you can also convert them into quasi-two-dimensional atoms in which the electrons sort of orbits in a plane, and how you can control those. Now, all of those experiments were undertaken using potassium Rydberg atoms. Recently, we've decided that we're going to switch to studies with strontium Rydberg atoms, both beams of strontium Rydberg atoms and cold atomic samples. Now, this work represents a sort of a, a combination of the efforts in two laboratories, namely my, my laboratory and that of Tom Killian, who is an expert at cooling and trapping strontium Rydberg atoms. And as such, it involves a very large number of graduate students, four of whom are actually here, Xinhui Zhang, uh, Francisco Camargo, Brian DeSalvo, and Roger Ding. So if you need more information, I suggest you talk to them. The students always know more about it than the advisor. We've also enjoyed a very productive theor theoretical collaboration with Joachim Bergdorfer and his group in Vienna. So why did we decide to switch to study in strontium. Why were we putting all this extra effort to learn about a new Rydberg species? Well, the fact is that strontium provides you an opportunity to probe new aspects of Rydberg physics. For example, strontium has an, act, an optically active core ion. This means that it has a strong resonance transition between the S and the P state at 422 nanometers, so it will give strong fluorescence. If you start out, however, with a low L Rydberg state, it, which penetrates the core, if you excite the core, then you don't get fluorescence, you get just autoionization. If, however, you change the L of the electron so that it now goes to a more circular orbit, it doesn't interact with the core ion, the core ion becomes essentially an independent particle. It will fluoresce very strongly, and you'll be able then to image those high L Rydberg states. So we have a tool then where we can image high L states, so you can actually monitor L changing reactions going between high and low L states, and also get a physical picture of where the Rydberg atoms are. Also, it has two valence electrons. So you can create both singlet and triplet excited states, and these can have variously attractive or repulsive interactions. So if you have multiple Rydberg atoms, you can control their interactions. Also, you have the possibility of creating two electron excited states, two valence electrons. In principle, you can excite both, and then you would like to see if you can produce states in which those electron motions are strongly correlated, and you can get sort of a two electron excited state that is long lived, that doesn't undergo auto ionization. So the idea might be can you produce the analog of the Bohr model of a helium atom with two excited electrons, two localized wave packets going around and not auto ionizing each other? Also, a thing I will come back to, you have these narrow intercombination lines. The singlet-triplet transitions are relatively weak, and therefore the lines are narrow. And as I will show, this will offer you longer coherence times when you're dealing with Rydberg dress states. And this is what we're hoping to use to tune the interactions in a cold gas. Now, there are a number of practical reasons why it's nice to work with strontium. There is no ground state hyperfine structure for the even isotopes. So that simplifies the excitation spectra. And also the excitation wavelengths that you need are well matched to diode lasers or frequency double diode laser systems. And you can get, therefore, very efficient excitation, allowing the possibility, even in a beam, of studying Rydberg Rydberg interactions. <coughs> now, the apparatus we use is very similar to that we used previously for sodium. The only difference is we use two photon excitation to NS or ND states. This requires radiation at 461 nanometers to get to the intermediate 5S5P state, and then at around 413 nanometers to get up to the Rydberg state. We start out with a strongly collimated beam of strontium atoms. We direct these two laser beams that counter propagate so that since they have comparable wavelengths, the Doppler effect essentially the first order cancels. The 461 nanometer beam is not focused. 
the 413 nanometer beam is focused to a radius of about a, to a diameter rather of about 170 microns. By using the cross laser beams, we can reduce the Doppler lens <coughs> to better than 5 megahertz. Also, remember, we operate the experiment in pulse mode. We chop the output of the 461 nanometer laser into pulses of about 500 nanosecond duration. We create a burst of Rydberg atoms. We can then apply electric field pulses to them by putting fast voltage pulses to these two electrodes. And we can detect the number that survived by field ionization. We apply a voltage ramp to this lower electrode. Any electrons that are produced are attracted to the electron multiplier and are detected. Now, the multiplier we use is just actually the Bellmouth channeltron. So we can only detect one Rydberg atom during after one laser pulse. Because once you've seen one pulse in the channeltron, its name is killed, it takes some time to recover before it will see another one. So we have to do these experiments presently, one Rydberg atom at a time, if you like, to keep the probability of excitation low. Now, because we've got good laser powers, we can get large excitation rates. And what I show here, a variety of photo excitation spectra as a function of relative total photon energy, the sum of the two photon energies. And we're tuning here in the vicinity of about N equals 280. The numbers here denote the tuning of the 461 nanometer laser that's going to the intermediate P-state. We choose these to selectively excite transitions in the different strontium isotopes. This set of data were recorded with that laser optimally tuned to excite transitions in the majority 88 strontium isotope. And what you see is a series of sharp lines. These sharp lines correspond to excitation of the 88 isotope to N equals 282, 283, and so on. You also see a smaller series of peaks which correspond to excitation of NS levels. If we detune the laser by 122 megahertz, what you see is that you get a new, again a series of Rydberg's peaks, but interestingly they're not at the same position as this, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So here we're preferentially tuned to excite the 86 isotope, it's about 8% in the beam, so we get reasonable excitation spectra. You still see some residual excitation of the 88 isotope. If you then detune by 273 megahertz, you're optimally tuned to create the N equal the uh, 84 isotope, and you see yet another new series of Rydberg peaks, and they correspond to the excitation of the 84 strontium isotope with N equals 283, 284, or whatever. Now, the fact that these Rydberg series don't coincide for the 88, the 86, and the 84 strontium isotope is because there are isotope shifts in the series limits, and by looking at the positions of these, you can get them. They're about 210 megahertz and about 440 megahertz. These were measured earlier at lower N by Pendrel and work with co-workers, but in fact, we reproduced them rather nicely at high N. If you tune the laser to excite transitions optimally in the odd 87 isotope, then you get a raft of new features that are indicated by green here. They're very difficult to interpret because you get hyperfine induced single triplet interactions and you get interactions between neighboring end states. Now, as you can see here, we get really large excitation features when we optimally tune to create the 88 strontium isotope. We can actually get densities in the beam of about 3 times 10 to the fifth per cubic centimeter. Rydberg separation is of about 150 microns, so it looks like we're going to be able to approach the blockade radius in, at, at, at these high end. Now, I thought I'd include this, since <laughs> there have been suggestions that we never publish spectra. So here is just the spectra. These are spectra obtained say, in, N equals, in the vicinity of N equals 311, going up to about 490. What you see as you go up in N is that the features reduce in size. Well, that's not unexpected. The oscillator strengths are going down. And you see that they begin to broaden. You begin to see mixing between the various states. And this is because we have stray residual fields in the apparatus. 
<coughs> above about n equals 500, you can, it's very hard to discern any Rydberg series. And this is because the string fields are such that start states and adjacent manifolds are beginning to overlap. Everything gets washed out. This happens at n equals 500 at a stray field of about 50 microvolts per centimeter. So this basically says we can reduce our fields down to 50 microvolts per centimeter. As I will show later when I'm talking about excitation of NF states, we can now actually do better than that, and we can now get a very nice spectra up to about n equals 600. So we can produce well-defined high-end rhythm states. Now the question is, how do our spectra compare to theory? And the first thing to remember is that strontium is not well described by a single active electron model. You can get good fits to the energy level by coming up with a pseudo potential, which, mod which models the potential when you're getting close. But whilst you can get good fits to the energy levels, the oscillator strengths for the excitation and S and D levels that you calculate are way off. You calculate, in fact, that S should be stronger than D, whereas experiment shows it's exactly the opposite way <coughs> around. So our theoretical collaborators have used a two-active electron model with a Hamiltonian similar to that that was discussed by Tom Gallagher. Two kinetic energy terms, the interaction of the two electrons among themselves. These single electron terms use the potential for the strontium-2 plus ion. In these calculations, there is a model potential for strontium-2 plus ions that has been published, and this is what was actually used. And then using ha this Hamiltonian, you get the eigenenergies and the eigenvalues by numerical diagonalization. When you do this, you find you can get good convergence with only using six inner electron orbitals. Okay? So it's not as a horrendous a calculation as it might appear. Now, the calculations, however, can only be done up to n of about 85, so we have to extrapolate to high n using the Rydberg-Ritz formula when we're comparing the calculations at up to 85 with our experimental data up at 300. You heard about the Rayleigh-Ritz formula where you got an energy-dependent term from Frederick's earlier talk. So the question is, how well does it do? How well do we get the uh, quantum defects? And what is shown here are the is the quantum defect as a function of n, principal quantum number. There is the theory is the solid line. The experiment are the various red dots. And what you find is that there's reasonable agreement. The quantum defects are large for the <coughs> sp and d state. And there's good reasonable agreement. And if you take the series limits for the s states, you get a quantum defect of 3.26, which is in very good agreement with what is measured. For the P states, 2.65, a little below what is measured. And for the D states, again, just a little below what is measured. Okay? So you might be able to do better than this, theoretically, if you were to tweak on the strontium 2 plus model potential. But these calculations were just undertaking using the value that is in the literature. So we could probably do, or they could probably do a little better if they were allowed to tweak on this. Now, as you noticed in the previous spectrum that I showed you, the excitation of D states was dominant, and that is actually what this theory predicts. Now, most of the work I talked about previously, remember, started with producing quasi-one-dimensional Rydberg atoms. So the question is, can we produce quasi-1D Rydberg states in strontium? And the answer is yes, but it's not easy. And the reason for that is shown by the stark energy spectrum that is shown here. The black lines are the calculated <laughs> energy levels for n equals 50, and we're dealing here with the n plus or minus 1 states. Okay? And you see the usual spread of, of, of manifold of stark states, and then here's the p state and the d state, here's the <coughs> f state. These have sizable quantum defects. There's no s state because uh, this is just n equals plus or minus 1. Now, for producing quasi-1D one sta quasi one states, the D states are the key, okay? Now, the D states, which are initially very strongly excited, this is an excitation spectrum in zero field, you see that they, as you increase the field, they undergo a quadratic Stark effect. They don't interact very strongly with this manifold of strongly polarized Stark states here. It's only when you get up to the near the star crossing field here that you see this avoided crossing 
begin to kick in, and you see that this state then acquires the character of these extreme rate shifted stock states. The problem is, as you turn the field on, you mix, you start getting L mixing, so the L equals two character of the D state decreases, so the excitation rate goes way down. Okay? Now, this evolution, that as you increase the field, the D states actually become quasi one dimensional, can be seen by taking the calculated states and expanding them in terms of the hydrogenic parabolic states. And what you get is shown here. So what is shown here are the distribution in K for the ND states excited in various fields. And this is a scale field of one here corresponds to where states from adjacent stark manifolds begin to overlap. And what is shown here is the distribution in the parabolic quantum number K. And you remember that is a measure of the polarization of the state. The larger the magnitude of K, the larger the polarization of the state. And plus values of K are polarized in one direction, minus K in the other. So the minus K are rate shifted, the plus K are blue shifted stark states. And if you start out in zero field, if you look at the D state, that distribution in K states is symmetric. You have no dipole moment. As you increase the field, you see this begins to become increasingly asymmetric. And when you get up near scale fields of one, you see that you've got a distribution that's strongly peaked towards the red most strongly polarized states. And this is seen here where we've calculated the scale <coughs> dipole moment for the state as a function of the applied field. And you see here's the D state. As, as the field increases, this gets quite large. And when you get close to the crossing field, it has a dipole moment of about 1.25 scale units, so it's 1.25 n squared, which is close to the maximum of 1.5 n squared. Okay? So near the crossing field, we've got a state which has a narrow mix of strongly polarized extreme rate shifted stark states. Okay? Interestingly, if you look at the P states, they remain largely unpolarized. Now the question is, do we really produce polarized states? So how can you do a measurement? Or how can you measure what the dipole moment of the state that you produce actually is? Well, there are three ways that we have devised to do this, and all of them involve the application of pulsed electric fields. The first one is ionization by a field set. A field pulse that will suddenly turn on, rise time very much less than the orbital period of the electron, it stays on for a couple of orbital periods, and then you suddenly turn it off. Okay? So we ionize in a field step of about one, whose duration is of, of the order of a couple of the Kepler periods. Okay? Now, you can imagine that if I have a state which is polarized in this direction, and I apply a pulsed field trying to ionize it in that direction, then the ionization probability should be very different than if I try to ionize it in the opposite way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next view graph. But basically, you'd expect an asymmetry if you have a strongly polarized state when I try to ionize it that way and try to ionize it in the opposite direction. <coughs> Another way you can tell if you've got a quasi one dimensional state is to ionize it by a train of half cycle pulses. As I showed a couple of lectures ago, if you have a state which is quasi one dimensional in this direction, if you subject it to a periodic train of half-cycle pulses, if you kick it towards the nucleus, you have the chance of dynamical stabilization. The atoms can survive a lot of kicks. This was playing tennis against a brick wall, you remember, with a ball that could come back. And you could get this dynamical stabilization. You could stop the atom ionizing. If, however, we reverse the direction of the kicks, then it ionizes very quickly. You get complete chaotic motion. So another signature of having a strongly polarized quasi-1D state is that survival probabilities would be very different if you kicked it multiple times away from the nucleus or if you kicked it multiple times towards the nucleus. The third way is to remember that quasi-1D states are the starting point to create near-circular states. Okay? And then how we can follow the evolution of those circular states very well using the field state. So if we have good quasi-1D states, we should be able to produce good quality circular states. Okay. 
Let's start out with the first of those methods. What happens? So what I'm going to talk about now is ionization by a field step. A field that comes on up and then goes down. Now, when you have the field step present, the electron potential is modified. Instead of just being a 1 over r potential, you include a start shift term z times the strength of the field. And this introduces then a linear component, and you get a saddle point on the downhill side of the nucleus. Okay? So we have this, in the presence of the field there, you distort the Coulomb potential, you get the saddle point on the downhill side. Okay? Now what is shown here are the trajectories of two strongly polarized orbits, one aligned on the downhill side, one aligned on the uphill side. Here we start out an orbit on the downhill side, it heads towards the nucleus, it scatters off the nucleus, it comes back, Oh, and it's heading straight for the saddle point. So it goes straight for the saddle point, oh, goes over it, and escapes. So if you have a quasi 1D state elliptical orbits on the downhill side, they will ionize in under one orbital period. Now you say, well, let's say we had a quasi 1D state oriented in the other direction. So now what you have are elliptical orbits in this sense. So the electron says, oh, there's a saddle point over here, so it starts coming down. But when it gets to the nucleus, the nucleus scatters it back. So it goes back. And then it tries again, but gets rescattered. So the result is classically what happens is this electron is frustrated in its attempt to ionize because it has to get the past the core ion, and the core ion scatters it back. So what happens if you're in this case, if you only have a few orbital periods, it's very, very much less likely to ionize. So by measuring the asymmetry, in the ionization, when you have the field in one direction or the other direction, then you can get a measure of how asymmetric or, or how strongly polarized a particular state is. Interestingly, the trajectories on the uphill side are not ionized. They're the ones that are in high, that actually have higher energies. Their star shifts are positive. So you think, well, they're above. They're much higher above that classical barrier. Why don't they ionize? And they don't ionize because quantum mechanically, their probability density distribution is restricted up over here, which is what you see on this classical simulation. So it's a little counterintuitive the way it actually works, but it's correct. So now let's look and see if we do see strong asymmetries in the ionization characteristics. And here I'm ionizing with a field step of about 100 millivolts per centimeter and a time period equals 2.3 orbital periods. And what I show here is the ionization probability as a function of the size of the ionizing field when I have different DC fields applied, which should give you different degrees of quasi-one-dimensionality. In the absence of any DC field, when we're just creating a pure D state, you see an ionization characteristics that look something like this. Now, if I excite in a field which is 40% of the crossing field, you see that depending as to whether I kick in one direction or the other, there's a big asymmetry in the probability of ionization for these different values in applied field. If I keep going up in applied field, you see that by the time I get close to the crossing, there's a very substantial difference in the ionization probabilities when we kick one way or the other way. Okay? Now, also shown here are the results of two theoretical calculations that use different models. The first one here, the hybrid L distribution, that recognizes the fact that at low fields, there's not a lot of stark mixing going on. It's a quadratic stark effect. So you have basically a mix of low L states. So what this is, is what is done here is to expand the initial state in terms of a series of low L states. The blue lines are when you expand the states in terms of the hydrogenic parabolic states. Okay? You would expect that if you're at low fields, the hybrid L model where we've just got a distribution of low L states might work pretty well. And you see here, for example, at an intermediate field, the parabolic, the uh, hybrid L model works pretty, pretty well. It, 
is in pretty good agreement with the experiment. When you go to very strong fields, however, you would expect that you really do have a mix of parabolic start states, and you see in that limit that that model works much better and agrees much better with the experimental data. So what you're seeing here is that we are producing strongly polarized states and that the calculations we undertake in using dipole moments of 1.1 to 1.2 n squared, and that's a pretty good estimate of the size of the polarization that we've been able to get. The other way to know you've done well is to produce quasi-circular states, okay? So now in this one, remember, what is done is to apply a pump field transverse to the quasi-1D atom, allow it to evolve, into a near circular state and then turn off the field. If you start out with a pure P state, remember you get counter propagating components. So what happens is one in one direction there's a strong oscillation in the electron position. In the orthogonal direction, there's very little. There's one's going left while the other's going right. Okay? So that if one was to look at how the expectation value of X and T and Z and T varies in time. If you have zero applied field and you measure how these vary experimentally, you would expect to see very little oscillation in one direction, very large oscillation in the other direction. And that's borne out by both the theoretical <coughs> models. However, if you apply a large field of 500 microvolts per centimeter, you, start, you see that there's a strong oscillation in both directions, indicative that you've now got a single localized wave packet that's going around in the circle. There's this bigger change in this component of the position of the electron as opposed to the orthogonal direction. So we can, in fact, produce strongly polarized quasi-1D states. The problem, as I showed previously, is that the oscillator strength goes way down. So we're not producing large numbers. So we decided we'd explore then the possibility of three photon excitation. And to do this, we would make a transition from the S squared state, 5S5P, 5S5D, and then up to the Rydberg state. So this requires radiation of 461 nanometers, 768 nanometers, 893 nanometers. And again, those radi that radiation at those wavelengths is relatively easy to produce. Uh, you can, we, this is just a regular diode laser. This is a Thai sapphire laser. And the advantage of that is that from a Thai sapphire laser, you get about a watt of power at the wavelengths we require. So this should really give us big excitation rates, okay? So, the apparatus is the same as before. This should be the 461. This is a historic misprint. One beam, the 461 nanometer beam goes this way. The other two beams are superposed and come the opposite way to reduce the effective Doppler line width. And again, we get it down to well under 5 megahertz. Well, let's ask the question then, what does one expect? So here I show the <coughs> calculated star structure again for the for strontium in the vicinity of about n equals 50. Here are the various start levels. Here's the D state. Now this has n equals 0 state, so this is the S state. Here's the F state. And you notice the F state, even in very weak fields, interacts very strongly with the neighboring stark manifold. And before you get to field strengths of half the way to the crossing field, it's already assumed the character of this state. Now the question is, do you get good oscillator strengths? And here are some of the calculated oscillator strengths. The blue is what they calculate for the case of two-fold excitation. The red now for three-fold excitation. And you see in this expanded diagram here, in the vicinity where the fields are low, you've still got strong excitation peaks, okay? So theory suggests that the oscillated strengths will be sizable, and it also predicts that you will get strong polarization, even at relatively small applied fields. And this is indicated here. Again, the state is expanded in terms of parabolic quantum number states, so it's my k of minus 50 to 50, here's the applied field, and you see this very quickly becomes asymmetric, and when you get out to fields above about 30-40% of the uh, crossing field, it's basically strongly polarized. Okay. <coughs> so here are some excitation spectra. So in zero field, you see a very strong excitation of the F state, 
and then here's the uh, P state, and then F state, P state, and so it goes. Now, as we apply the field, you see the amplitude of the F state decreases, and you begin to see broadening as we're interacting with the neighboring star particle. <coughs> and by the time you get to 200 microvolts per centimeter, you're seeing you're exciting across the star manifold. The P state shifts very little, and as you go to higher fields, you start <coughs> being able to excite D states. Now, this spectrum in zero field is very, very sensitive to stray fields because it's close to that neighboring level and mixes strongly. So one very nice way to get the field minimized is to optimize the quality of the spectrum in this point. And doing that, we can now get the fields down to about 25 microvolts per centimeter and reduce the field in homogeneity. In homogeneity. Do we produce quasi-1D states? Well, yes, but before talking about that, let me talk about something else. Remember, I talked about the fact that we had a tie sapphire laser that would produce about a watt of power. So the suggestion is that we should get really good photo excitation rates, even at n equals 300. Okay? And the answer is yes, we do. And this is shown here, which shows the probability of excitation of a Richberg atom during a laser pulse as a function of other temperature, which is also then beam density, because you up the temperature, you up the beam density. We use a 600 nanosecond laser pulse, and we can only measure one Wittberg atom per laser shot. So as we go to higher beam densities, we have to attenuate the laser beam, okay? And then what we've done, these have taken directly, these are measurements you would get by simply saying extrapolate the density by multiplying these by 20, these by 400. And you see we get to where we can produce something like 100 Wittberg atoms per laser shot, assuming there's no dipole-dipole interaction blockade or anything like that. So we can get extrapolated densities of 5, 10 to the 6 per cubic centimeter, which correspond to interparticle spacings of under 100 microns. Well, if you have two quasi-1D atoms, mu1, mu2 <coughs> over r squared turns out to be the di I give you a blockade radius of about 100 nanometers, so of 100 micrometers, rather. So we should be well into the blockade regime. The atoms are strongly polarized. We can do the same kinds of measurements we did before. So here we're looking again at the symmetry in the ionization probability when you kick this way and this way. And here are data showing the survival probability as a function of kick strength for fields ranging from zero to only 200 microvolts per centimeter. And you see as you increase the field, you get a very, very pronounced asymmetry. So we can produce very nice quasi-one-dimensional states. Okay? The polarizations are similar, but actually a tad better than those we get with D states. And another thing is, you remember, we've got the whole Stark manifold. At intermediate fields, you've got a broad feature corresponding to excitation in the Stark manifold. So by tuning the laser to the red side of the Stark manifold, you'll get states strongly polarized in this direction. To the middle, they're not polarized. To the other side, they're strongly polarized in the opposite direction. And we've been able to show you can do this. So you can use strongly polar. You can tune the polarization <coughs> by tuning this across the start manifold. Interestingly, no matter what the field, the polarization for the P states, as measured by this asymmetry, stays very small. Now the other thing we talked about was well, you can always test them by producing near circular states. And what you remember was when you turn off the pump pulse, the state locally. Look, undergoes transient localization, delocalizes, relocalizes. We talked about this last time. These are quantum beats. But look how much better the quantum beats are than we ever got with potassium. We're getting quantum beats out now to three microseconds. So the de de decoherence rate is extremely slow. And we believe this is due to the fact that we're able to reduce our field hom in homogeneities in these cases. So we can maintain the coherence of this mesoscopic system for extended periods. The problem is we are doing a beam experiment, so the atoms move out of the observation region and out of the region where we've locally zeroed the electric field. So where are we going to go with these experiments? I always feel a little nervous about talking about possible future directions in case there's something that we've missed and that I've screwed up. 
Well, what we would like to do is we would like to monitor the evolution of atomic L state distributions via fluorescence from the core ion. So we create a low L Rydberg state. We won't get fluorescence. And then either through collisions or by inducing precession in an applied field, we should be able to see the L state distribution change by the observation of fluorescence. We also like to excite Rydberg atoms at carefully controlled separations. We can do this either by using two focal spots or by using just taking advantage of dipole blockade. Now, what we would then have is two, into two atoms at a well-defined separation, which are not necessarily strongly interacting. Then simultaneously, we'll excite both of these, say, n equals 300 atoms up to n equals 600. Now, they would normally, say, be dipole blockaded in that region. You could never produce them under those conditions other than by kicking them. So what you would have then is a pair of atoms which are strongly interacting with known initial conditions because we launched them out at t equals zero. So then the question is, you know, how does such a strongly coupled pair of Rydberg atoms behave? You can imagine all sorts of things. You could say, can we get long-lived two electron excited states? Could I have two dipoles like this, that were originally oriented like this, and then I kick them both to higher end states, so the electrons are simultaneously doing this, but those electrons would be correlated, their motion, they'd stay far apart. Would this turn off autoionization? Could I get a long-lived pair of highly excited states in which I sort of arrange the orbital motions, okay? And of course, you can help that by driving the system. So external driving might enable us to create quasi-stable molecular Rydberg states. It'd be kind of cute if we can do it. Another thing is, you remember, you've got two excited electrons. So another possibility is to create long-lived quasi-stable two electron excited states. I talked about creating the model of the Bohr atom with a single electron system and creating Trojan wave packets. Now, one way you could get a two electron excited state if you're going to do that, you have to stop autoionization. So you have to have good control of where they are and keep them apart. Because if they once collide, they autoionize. They transfer energy and the system is dead. So one way